In this video, we're going to wrap up our introduction by considering um, a few more features of cybersecurity and start with the concept of risk management. We talked about what risk is in terms of a threat acting on a vulnerability which will lead to some sort of economic loss, an impact of a significant kind. This is an example of a risk management process that's outlined by an organization called the OECD, and it's part of a policy that they have published that uh, all governments should help their or companies and organizations within their nations to implement. So in this risk management process, it starts off with risk assessment. And the idea here is that you determine the level of risk um, of every activity that you undertake and then you know, decide um, how you're actually going to go about treating it. The OECD simplifies risk treatments into four categories. So you can either take that risk and not do anything about it. You can reduce it. And we'll come back to how you reduce it in a second. You can transfer it to a third party, which we mentioned before is either take out cyber insurance or use third parties to manage some infrastructure for you, or you can avoid it. You can end the activity. If you decide to reduce the risk, you can actually put in place security measures, that's controls, uh, to actually uh, then mitigate the risk or reduce it. And we covered that in a little bit of detail. Or you can actually innovate and adapt the activity uh, so that the risk is not present anymore. Uh, you could even change the activity uh, to do something else to avoid that risk. Uh, and then you could uh, you know, put in measures that uh, create preparedness, which will reduce the risk as well. So if you have uh, measures, for example, to quickly act on any incident that happens, then the overall impact to the organization is going to be less. Once you've done all of this treatment, obviously there's a process of monitoring um, through some sort of governance structure that you implement in the company and then the cycle starts off again. Risk analysis itself can be split into two different types, qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative is where we're not going to try and calculate the absolute levels of risk, so how much everything would cost if a particular threat acted on a specific vulnerability but we're going to give it a priority. And in most cases, that's high, medium, or low. The problem with that is that it's uh, you know, very easy to implement, but it doesn't actually give us an awful lot of information. For example, what does that mean in terms of the overall cost? You know, How do you know how much money you want to spend to actually control that risk? Quantitative risk analysis, on the other hand, works out the numbers for frequency of risk events based on detailed understanding of your assets, the threats that are involved, and the vulnerabilities. So this actually needs a bit of maturity of an organization and obviously access to detailed organizational information. You have to know what things the company does and what they do it with and who does it and what times. You have to understand the threat landscape. You have to understand vulnerabilities. Um, and that all takes a level of organization that a lot of um, companies don't have, especially the small to medium-sized enterprises. In a quantitative risk assessment, what we start with is a valuation of the asset. We have to know how much the asset costs. And then we work out that for every threat acting on a vulnerability, what was the percentage of that valuation would it impact? So that's our exposure factor. And from that, we can calculate that if a single loss happened, a threat acted on a vulnerability, um, what the ex loss expectancy would be. Then we work out how often it's going to happen. And that's, we talk about an annualized rate of occurrence. And from that, we can work out an annualized loss expectancy. Now that we understand how much we're going to lose potentially every year from this risk, we can then work out how much we want to spend and prioritize on countermeasures. So let's take an example. You own an iPhone 12, which costs 
$1,349. And if you drop the phone and the screen breaks, the cost of repair is around $850. This is assuming that you don't have any insurance. This is numbers that I took a few months ago, so they may have varied. Uh, let's say you've dropped the phone on average once every two years. So the cost of the asset is 1349 The exposure factor, if you uh, crack the screen, is 0.63, which is basically the percentage that you would have to pay uh, to get it repaired. Um, the single loss expectancy, therefore, is $850. And the annualized rate of occurrence is 0.5. So we uh, expect that once every, well, half a time a year, but once every two years, we're going to do that. So the annualized loss of expectancy is 0.5 times 850, which means that if we set aside $425 every year, we would cover the uh, expected loss of dropping the screen, dropping the phone and repairing the screen. Now, Apple Care Plus costs $200 for three years and $45 per incident for screen replacement. The annualized cost of insurance is going to be about um, $67 plus 45 times 0.5, which means $92. So you can see that it would be worth having insurance because if you drop the phone uh, every two years, then uh, you're saving a considerable amount of money by uh, taking out the insurance. Now, of course, this isn't the only way that you can protect against this type of loss. You can buy a case significantly cheaper, and it may or may not um, avoid the actual uh, screen cracking. You can put screen protectors on, for example. So. These decisions aren't necessarily always straightforward, but you have to start by knowing the actual numbers involved to be able to work out what you're going to do about a particular risk. We mentioned before that um, you would have to understand the threats that face you uh, when looking at risk management. And to do that, uh, organizations themselves, or they get a third party to do it, would undertake a threat analysis and undertake and use models to then work out what threats they may be facing. So threat models ask the following basic questions with reference to a particular system because of all threats, uh, even though there may be hackers out there, they may be targeting particular industries and particular systems, for example. So what we need to know is who the attackers are, why they're attacking and how they're attacking. Ultimately, this allows for the calculation of risk and for which there must be a vulnerability, a threat and some impact, as we said before. So threat models need to be applied to a system as a whole, not just to specific parts of a machine learning pipeline in isolation, for example. And they need to be based on realistic solution scenarios with credible threat actors and credible goals and motivations. So it's actually quite a complicated process and this is why uh, most organizations would outsource this to a specialist cybersecurity firm to undertake the threat analysis and modeling and then provide that information to the company to act on. There are a variety of different threat models and here are just a few with uh, intriguing names like PASTA, which is the process for attack simulation and threat analysis, Stride, which is Microsoft's, and that's really more related to threats to software. And that stand, STRIDE stands for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, elevation of privilege. Uh, we'll go into that in more detail. Another model is attack trees that describe the steps needed for a threat to be actioned. And it's uh, represented in a tree structure. Uh, so attacks don't happen singly and in isolation. You, there are various steps that are taken. And then there's the hybrid threat modeling model um, called by the SEI, um, which is called persona non grata. And again, this tries to build up a profile of the types of threat actors that you might be facing. Some of these threat models focused on different vulnerabilities in different assets and also on different types of threat actors. 
Vulnerability assessment is the other important aspect to undertake a risk management or risk assessment. And to work out the vulnerabilities, we need to determine the weaknesses in the organization's assets that when exploited by a threat will obviously lead to an economic loss. Um, vulnerabilities have their own classification, um, what's called an ontology, and they're represented in a variety of different ways, which we will cover. But uh, there are a lot of vulnerabilities are classified as they're discovered, whether it's in software, hardware, or other systems. And there is the US National Vulnerability Database. There's common vulnerabilities exposures. Um, there are vulnerabilities that are managed by computer emergency readiness and then response teams. They are uh, on a national level, so uh, most uh, countries will have, if not all countries, will have a CERT and they will catalog and uh, provide information on vulnerabilities. And then finally, there's another vulnerabilities database called VunDB. Although a vulnerability may be identified in software, um, whether it can be exploited or not depends on the system. So knowing vulnerabilities known alone is not always enough. We have to know that there is actually a threat actor that could exploit it. Um, this isn't always that easy. Uh, for example, you may think that a system that is not connected to the internet and what is known as an air-gapped system may not be vulnerable from threats from outside an organization. But of course, that's not true. And when we look at the case study of malware called Stuxnet, which was targeted at nuclear processing facilities, uh, there was a very good example of where the malware was uh, introduced into um, a engineer's laptop who then took it into a system uh, infected USBs by, by way of US, infected USBs and then infected the centrifuges within the processing plant. So uh, it's not obvious that vulnerabilities uh, that uh, you know potentially isolated aren't actually exploitable. So we can really always assume that. We identify the vulnerabilities, however, through asset management. Um, this allows us to understand what uh, assets we have, the hardware, software, specifically what versions and what updates have been applied. So we call those patches. Uh, we can also assess vulnerabilities through vulnerability scans, and we'll do that in one of the labs. So you get an idea of what, that's, what is involved there. And employing third party ethical hackers um, to actually try and break into a system and explore vulnerabilities through uh, penetration tests. This, once you've discovered the vulnerabilities, it enables you to prioritize um, these vulnerabilities through the process of risk assessment. And then of course, we can know what to do as a consequence of that. Once we've identified the risks um, through the threats and vulnerabilities, um, as we mentioned before, we can try and treat those risks and we can try and use controls. Uh, there is a focus of a large number of organizations, mainly through uh, IT-led organizations, to skip an awful lot of cybersecurity risk analysis and just go to the controls. And there's nothing particularly wrong with that, except that we're doing blindly. We're sort of saying, I don't know what the risks are, let's just put in some protective measures and just hope for the best, which is better than nothing, absolutely, but it's not done on an informed basis. So controls can be of three types, physical, technical, and administrative. And we also have the functions of the controls, which are preventative, detective, and corrective. This gives you an example of what all of that means. So a physical control, um, which is preventative, can be something like a fence, a gate, a lock. Uh, if we have a machine room, for example, we would put locks on the door. Uh, and not allow unauthorized personnel into that. Uh, detective, um, physical control, maybe CCTV and surveyors camera logs. A corrective one is repairing the physical damage to a lock, for example, or reissuing access cards. Technical controls are the ones that we're more concerned with because they're the realm of cybersecurity. 
um, are things like firewalls, intrusion protection systems, multi-factor authentication, um, antivirus software. Detective controls are intrusion detection systems, IDSs, and honeypots. Again, in one of the labs, we use a honeypot, and this is a system that you might put on your network that's designed to lure attackers and then essentially give them something to roam around and it's logging the um, access of that uh, information, that access, without actually risking any loss from the organization. Corrective technical controls may include patching, rebooting of systems, if there's malware in memory, for example, quarantining the malware through the antivirus and anti-malware software and other things that we'll look at. From an administrative perspective, this uh, preventative controls are around things like hiring and firing practices. So during doing due diligence, when you hire somebody, doing a police check, for example, um, organizing your uh, personnel through separation of duties. This means not having one single person doing too much that is critical to the organization. So if they actually do something wrong, then they're not going to cause significant harm um, and also doing things like data classification. Detective administrative controls are things like access rights, audit logs, and reviewing unauthorized changes. And then from a corrective perspective, it's uh, having things like incident response plans and business continuity. Finally, with Cybersecurity, there's a whole risk series of uh, standards and some of which we'll go into in a little bit more detail. And uh, I just mention um, a few here. The principal one, which is an international standard, which is called the ISO 27K series of standards. Uh, there are a lot of parts to that standard and the, they all relate to different aspects of the cybersecurity standard. So ISO 27001, for example, talks about um, the IT security techniques and requirements of information security management systems. Uh, 7005 relates to how you implement uh, information security risk management. And there are a whole range of those, and of course, any organization want to be in, wanting to be uh, certified as being ISO 27000 um, compliant um, needs to go through a process and have an external party that comes in and basically uh, does the certification process. Another uh, standard which is popular is a US standard from NIST and that's the SP800 um, standards. Um, in particular here, this 53, which is related to security and privacy controls for information systems and organizations. So as I mentioned before, um, if, if you can't manage to get uh, organizations to go through uh, what is deemed a sophisticated risk management process, then the next best thing is to get them to implement a certain set of controls. And Australia takes that one step further by advocating what they call the essential eight. So eight different types of control that every organization should uh, implement. In fact, uh, legislation dictates that all government organizations now have to have implemented the essential eight, especially if they're um, deemed to be critical infrastructure. 